Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Last time we introduced the operational amplifier, or op-amp for short, a device that amplifies the voltage difference between its inputs with astonishingly high gain in input impedance. We showed how feeding its output directly back to its inverting input yields a nearly perfect voltage follower by the magic of negative feedback. By artificially inserting a resistor in its output, we showed that the op-amp's output impedance doesn't matter all that much. It continued to do whatever was necessary to make the follower follow, even when we loaded it down with a resistor whose value was only a tenth of the output impedance of our amplifier-resistor combination. I finished by asking you to consider what has to be going on at the output of the op-amp in that situation. It's not too hard to answer that question. We can ignore the feedback wire, since the first golden rule says that the op-amp inputs draw no current. That leaves us with a voltage divider. We know the formula for the divider ratio. If we pick off the circuit output directly from the op-amp output, we've just built an amplifier with a gain of 11. So I'll do that on the bench. I'll move my scope probe directly to the op-amp output, and immediately I have to adjust the vertical scale on the scope. Once I've done that, it shows the expected gain of 11. Just running a wire from the middle of the diagram here all the way to the output is going to give me kind of a cluttered diagram. So let me move the components around a little so that the layout is more conventional. We can make this into a generic non-inverting amplifier by replacing the resistor values with symbolic ones. And we can write down the equations for the gain, its input impedance, and its output impedance. The gain is determined by the divider and the feedback network. It can be almost any arbitrary figure, as long as it's at least one. The input impedance is very high, dominated by a few picofarads of capacitance. The output impedance is extremely low, thanks to the action of negative feedback. This circuit, called a non-inverting amplifier, is ubiquitous in the analog world. You'll quickly learn to recognize it on sight. By the way, a lot of people prefer to write this circuit with the plus input of the op-amp on top, because that avoids one wire crossing. So be careful when you read a schematic to note which way the plus and minus inputs are drawn. I've gotten that backward more than once. In this case, I had an ulterior motive for drawing it the way I did. Let me avoid the wire crossing by moving the lower resistor of the divider along with the associated wiring. When we do that, we see something interesting. The left side of the diagram looks like the conventional way to draw the input of an amplifier, except that it has the ground at the top and the input at the bottom. What would happen if we drew it conventionally? That is, what if we made the signal and ground trade places? Let's walk through it. The first thing we want to notice is that the plus input of the op-amp is grounded. That means that the feedback loop will work hard to hold the minus input at ground potential. Anything connected to it will behave as if it's grounded. Engineers call a point like this a virtual ground. Don't ever be tempted to tie it to a real ground. If you did, the op-amp wouldn't have to do any work to hold it at ground, so it wouldn't generate any output voltage. The first golden rule of op-amps tells us that the minus input is passing no current. Kirchhoff's current law then tells us that the currents through the two resistors have to balance. Ohm's law will then give us the formula for the output voltage. The gain is negative, so just as we called the previous circuit a non-inverting amplifier, we call this one an inverting amplifier. This one is even more common than the non-inverting amplifier. Because of the virtual ground, we can see at a glance that the input impedance is simply the resistance R1. The output impedance is still very low because it's still the output of an op-amp in a negative feedback loop. Let's verify that gain in input impedance on the bench. We'll continue with the same values of 1K for the input resistor and 10K for the feedback resistor. I expect to see a gain of negative 10. And that's what I get. Now let me tie another 1K resistor in series with the function generator. 
if the input impedance of the circuit is also 1K, then I expect it will cut both input and output voltages precisely in half. And again, that's what I see. The best we can say about the input impedance is that it's moderate. You might protest, why? I could scale those resistors to any value I please. I could make that input resistance 100 megohms and the feedback resistor 1 gigohm if I wanted to. Well, not really. Such a high impedance node will be prone to pick up lots of noise. But even worse, remember that there are at least a few picofarads of input capacitance about. If we have the 8 picofarads of capacitance that we measured in the last episode, that 100 megohm resistor would make a low pass filter with a 200 hertz corner frequency. Almost all our circuits need more bandwidth than that. A few megohms is probably the upper bound of what we could use as a practical matter. So why is the inverting amp so common, even though the non-inverting one has better input impedance? One big reason is that we can add additional inputs. The circuit will compute a scaled sum of their voltages. We can simply tie another resistor, or multiple resistors, into our virtual ground. Here I'm showing a potentiometer between the power rails as the second signal source. The gain for that signal source will be the 10k feedback resistor divided by the 24k input resistor, or 5 twelfths. That should give us an offset voltage at the output between negative 5 and positive 5 volts, added to the 10 volt peak to peak signal that we have already. It's worth noting that these two inputs cannot interfere with one another. Each one has its own input resistor, and the other end of the resistor is a virtual ground, so each input sees only a resistor to ground and not the other input signal. The property of adding signals and multiplying them by constants, by the way, is why an operational amplifier is called operational. It carries out mathematical operations. Let's add that potent resistor and see the addition in action. I have the modified circuit here on the breadboard. When I power it on and provide it with a 1 volt peak to peak sine wave, I get the same gain of 10 that I did last time. When I adjust the pot, I can move the output offset up 5 volts or down 5 volts. The signals are indeed being added, and the plus or minus 12 volt input is being scaled to plus or minus 5 volts. We can add op amp summing circuit to our portfolio. Before I leave this circuit, I want to point out some of its limitations. If I change the input voltage to a volt and a half peak to peak and try the test again, things look good at first. I get a 15 volt peak to peak signal out. But if I adjust the output voltage too far in either direction, the output signal clips. That's not a surprise. The sum would go beyond the power rail. But one thing that we also need to watch out for is that the minus input of the op amp is no longer a virtual ground, because the output can no longer balance the currents. If I add the minus input as a dark blue trace here, you can see how when the output clips, the input departs from ground potential. This can show up as a problem elsewhere in your circuit, because now the inputs are no longer independent. The input resistors will couple this non-zero voltage back into whatever is driving them, and whatever else in the circuit is seeing that. So one of the caveats is the golden rules is golden rule number two no longer works if the op amp is driven to saturation. So don't do that. Before we go, I thought it would be fun to make a circuit using a summing amplifier with lots of inputs, so I came up with this one. If we look at the input D0 here, we see that its input resistor is 480 kiloohms. The common feedback resistor is 400 ohms, so the output will be the input divided by 1200. A 12 volt input will yield a negative 10 millivolt output. Each successive resistor down the line is half of the one before it, so D1 will give a negative 20 millivolt output, D2 a negative 40 millivolt output, D3 a negative 80 millivolt output, and so on down the line, down to D7, which will give an output of 1.28 volts. Can you see what we did here? 
This is the core of a digital analog converter. If we give it a binary number at the inputs D7 to D0, it will generate an analog voltage proportional to that number. I've included in the schematic the possibility of using a row of dip switches to provide that binary number. This sub-circuit shows another feature of the summing amplifier. Let's take a look at what happens with an open circuit input to a summing amplifier. Remember that the minus input of the op amp is a virtual ground. As long as we don't abuse the op amp, it will be a ground potential. If we ground one of the inputs to the summing amplifier, then both sides of the corresponding resistor will be a ground potential. No current will flow. It's as if the resistor weren't there. On the other hand, if we leave the input an open circuit, then no current can flow in the corresponding resistor, and it still behaves as if it weren't there. Disconnecting an input of a summing amplifier is the same as grounding it. That means that a switch array like this doesn't need anything like pull-up or pull-down resistors. We can get away with these naked dip switches. Ignoring open inputs is also a useful property for a circuit like a mixer. For the most part, it won't have to worry about disconnected inputs. Just unplug them and everything will still work. Let's see the circuit in action. I have the switches connected with a DuPont cable for now. If I turn them on starting from the right, I see output voltages of 10 millivolts, 30 millivolts, Seventy millivolts, and so on. It looks good so far. Let me see if I can get precisely a volt. One volt is a hundred steps of ten millivolts each, so I need to set the switches to one hundred, which is zero one one zero zero one zero zero in binary. I'll try to get that in. It looks like a volt to me. What about two volts? That's 200 steps, or 11001000 in binary. It seems to be working again. Let's try some oddball figure, like 0 0.83 volts. 83 steps is 01010011 in binary. Zero point eight three volts. Just what we asked for. I wanted to make sure that this circuit works for all possible settings of the switches. So I hacked together an example that simply counts up through all the values. There's a full schematic in the project GitHub, link in the description, if you want to follow along. I used a 555 timer to generate a clock and then dropped in the first counter IC that I found in my parts box, a 4024. The 4024 is just a seven-stage counter, so I added an extra flip-flop. I didn't use the output of the 555 as one of the bits because I wanted the on and off times to be symmetric. Off camera, I moved the DuPont wires from the switches to the counter and turned on the power to see a scope trace of the output. Well, the best I can say is that it's not horrible. It certainly does show the ramp pattern we expect in stair steps of about 10 millivolts. The top of the wave is at ground, and the bottom is at negative 2.55 volts. That's good. There's a weird little glitch in the middle, exactly where the count transitions from 127 to 128. That happens because the actual resistance of the pair of 7.5 kilo ohm resistors are just a little low with respect to the other resistors in the stack. It's only a single count, maybe two, so the resistors are still within the 1% tolerance of the vendor promised. And there are short duration spikes all over the place. The trace looks like a porcupine. Those are mostly caused by the fact that I made a poor choice for the counter. It's a ripple counter, meaning that it changes state one bit at a time, from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. 
going from a count of 63, 111111 in binary, to 64, 1 followed by 6 zeros in binary, would transition ideally through 62, 60, 56, 48, 32, 0, and finally 64. That sequence results in a weird dip in the voltage followed by a jump to the correct value. That's what's going on in most of these spikes. I really should have used a synchronous counter where all the bits switch at the same time. Finally, a lot of these spikes are caused by crosstalk. The capacitance between adjacent wires in the DuPont cable is turning the fast state changes of the digital signal into voltage spikes on adjacent wires. Really, the only way to fix the crosstalk would be better construction, although I could try to clean it up with low-pass filtering. But I wouldn't build a real data A converter this way. There are packaged commercial solutions that will outperform anything I hack together. I just chose this as a good example of a summing amplifier, taking in multiple inputs and giving them arbitrary weights. So let's get back to the main topic, summing amplifiers. What could I do with a summing amplifier musically? Think of what goes into a mixer board. Do you think you could design an 8-channel mixer given what we know, now know about op-amps? Unfortunately, I think that's all I have time for in this episode. In the next episode in this series, I want to put more interesting things than resistors into the feedback loop. I've even got a few silly demos planned. But next time on the channel, I think I'm going to get back into the series on basic transistor circuits. I have a few viewers who have been bugging me to get into differential pairs, and as a general rule, a few commenters represent a lot of viewers. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that, and perhaps decide that I've earned your subscription, and ring the notification bell so you don't miss a new episode when it comes out. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye.